Jake Needham is not a man who sits still. He goes from strength to strength. He has a natural talent, flair, and knack for success. From film production to best-selling novelist. I'm here at Wine Connection in Supermitsoy 47, and we have a great show lined up for you today. Let's go meet Jake. Hi, Jake. Welcome to Beyond the Lands. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Keith. Appreciate you asking me. Thank you for talking to us. Um, an American in Australia. How did this, how did this happen? And, and none other than Alan Bond, mind you, a legend in his own. In his own time. mind. In <laughs> mind, yeah. Yeah. He's certainly done some stuff. God, Alan was a clown. I just, just, it's a strange guy. But I, I was practicing law in the U.S., and uh, Alan was one of our clients, and I was in Australia one day, and we were sitting out by the harbor in Sydney and the table was heaped with fresh seafood and we had bottles of wine sitting around and suddenly Alan says, well, what the hell, why don't, you, why don't you quit and come down here and join my board? And I heard myself saying, yeah, why the hell not? And so I did and that's really how it happened. You just ended up on the board of Alan Bonds. Bond Corp. Uh, Bond Corp yeah. We had a lot of uh, different interests in uh, broadcasting, real estate, uh, virtually everything, retailing, uh, the chain of department stores. And uh, I worked with Alan for a number of years back in the America's Cup days when, uh, right, when Alan was uh, pretty well tied up with the America's Cup boats that we were racing and I knew from nothing about sailing. I mean, I, I even wasn't particularly interested, yeah, yeah. but it? you had to pretend to be interested. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that Did was- Did you actually go out on the boats? Oh, and yes indeed, yeah, yes wow. indeed. Every, we practiced off Melbourne. And uh, so every weekend, Alan would load up the jet and we'd hail down to Melbourne and, uh, and I would sit on sail bags for about two days as yeah, these damn wow. boats went around in circles. And couldn't and even get a drink. Fantastic, mm -hmm. really. And that was around about 83. It was, exactly. He, they had a couple of attempts before that, right, to, to win the American but finally in 83 or something. Yeah, Alan put a lot of money in it. was a very big deal for him, and, and I can understand why. And there was a lot of yeah. pride in Australia. There was a lot of pride, was a, if you, anybody who remembers those races, it was really amazing that Australia got down three to one yeah. and came back and won three consecutive races, and, and the last one by just a hair. But, but watching those big time sailing races was extraordinary because, of course, boats don't race like this, yeah. they race like this. Yeah. Well, and so, because you go out in different directions and you tack back. So everyone is standing there on the, on the committee boat or wherever you are watching, and you see these two huge yachts miles apart, and then they tack back, and everyone's trying to get who's going to be in front, who's going to be in front, because generally when they cross, they're a meter or two apart, and the idea is for you to get in front of the other guy because you create a wind shadow, and then he's at a real disadvantage because your boat is shadowing his boat. And so it was, it was very strange things. I mean, what was the, Damon Runyon had a great line yeah. once about, uh, he thought the America's Cup was the only sporting event in the world that should begin upstream from Niagara Falls. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people feel that way about racing, but as the only American involved in the racing syndicate, it was quite an experience. Yeah, yeah. America held that for 130 oh, yeah, years. Oh yeah, absolutely. Incredible, I thought. And, and Bond also, he owned a Channel 9, so you, you yeah. also had a, you were involved in, in screenplay, writing screenplays? Well, not really, the not really the writing. I, I, running Nine was one of my responsibilities, and, and it's, it, in the end, it was how I ended up in the movie business, because yeah. out of a deal that we were doing, uh, fell a sort of broken down television production company in LA, uh, which I ended up buying, and, and that was how I got into, into the film business. Was it that that brought you to Asia? What, what actually brought you to Asia and Bangkok particularly? Well, I, I, you know, when I, when I worked with Alan and, and other companies in Australia after that, um, I ended up doing uh, merger and acquisition work primarily because that was really my corporate background. Yeah. And Australian companies, for better or worse, tended to look toward Asia yeah. for acquisitions and for expansion rather than to Europe or North America. So as the M&A guy, yep. I ended up working all over Asia, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Japan, Korea, everywhere. And so I became the sort of Asian guy for these, uh, these Australian corporations. And that was a great time in the 80s in Australia. It was the, the last days of cowboy capitalism. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just really sort of unfettered capitalism with people running around and buying companies with uh, 
loud pronouncements and big gestures. Yeah, yeah. And we pulled off some deals that I just, looking back on them, can hardly believe. But it, it had me involved in Asia, and I spent a lot of time here, and, and uh, that was, I suppose, my first exposure here. Yet you, you had some production films you were making here first before you wrote your first book, and um, Ali McGraw. Oh yeah, well, how did that, that come about? No, I, I, it's, when I ended up with this production company in L.A., um, it it obviously needed some restructuring, and because I knew Asia pretty well, the idea of doing some filming here was attractive because it was cheap. Yeah. I mean, with the exchange rate then and and circumstances, it was cheap, and and not very many American companies came out here, so. I put together a, a what really amounted to a business plan about how we could draw on my contacts here and people I knew and, and other contacts that we had in the States in order to film here uh, in, in Asia, not just Thailand, but in Southeast Asia generally. And, and one of the guys who worked for me sent it over to HBO in connection with another deal and he came in one day and said, oh, HBO wants to film that treatment you wrote. And, and I said to say, what are you talking about? I've never written a treatment. I'm not sure I know what one is. Oh, I don't know. He said, that, that treatment. Said, that's not a treatment. It's a damn business plan. <laughs> he said, well, no, HBO loves it. They want you to finish it up as a script and shoot it. So I thought, well, what the hell? And I sat down and wow. finished it up, and HBO bought it, and, and we shot it. And, so and that was that, what's the old joke about two weeks ago I couldn't spell screenwriter, now I are one. Yes. And, um, and that's sort of how it worked. Writing, writing screenplays and then you went to write a business plan, they probably had all the <laughs> similarities, really. Well, so I mean, there, there really is. I mean, in yeah. the film business, film is a business, and yeah. people seem to forget that, that uh, if you can't make a film for a commercially successful, yeah. under a commercially successful plan, you shouldn't make it. Yeah. It doesn't matter how artistic it is. And, and we found ways to shoot out here. You mentioned Ali. I, I, I wrote a a film which HBO shot out here, which actually turned out to be Ali's last film, and uh, uh, she was a terrific lady, and we had a lot of fun. And uh, uh, she was special on camera. Oh, it was an awful sure. film. It was a terrible film. Uh, but I mean, I never looked. You know, the, Woody Allen always says that after he makes a film, he refuses ever to see it again. I know how he feels. <laughs> I don't want to see any of the crap that I made, man. No. Wow, unbelievable. Tell me about the dy the, the relationship with paperbacks and eBooks today and how Amazon and its policies have changed over the years to where, where they're at today and what it means for writers today. Well, I, you know, I think what the rise of Amazon has really done is expose the uselessness of most of the publishing establishment. Go back five, eight, ten years, the only way for a writer to reach a reader was through a publisher that if the publisher didn't give you an audience you didn't get one now likewise same thing's true from a reader standpoint you were not permitted to read a writer unless that writer had been adopted and promoted by a publisher and so the promote uh, the publishers saw themselves as gatekeepers they determined what people could read and and what they were going to pay for what they were going to read and when amazon began to reach out directly to writers and, and Kindle became so popular, what really happened is it began to break down that relationship that writers who now publish through publishers are in a completely different business from writers who publish directly yeah. to Kindle. And I, I like that. I mean, I had a publisher and I killed my deal because I just got sick of it. Distribution was terrible. You're at, the, uh, you're at the mercy of the publisher well, you to, for your livelihood, for your success, for your promotion, for, for your brand, and so to speak. Publishers are notorious, as our film companies, yeah. for swindling their creative oh, the music people. industry. You can, we, we could keep, uh, okay, we could. there you go. I mean, it's, you know, you know what I mean <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's one of the, the problems. Distributors and I, you know, my books weren't being distributed in the U.S. at all. Not a single one of my books was available in the U.S. And, you know, I published out here, but it was a bit of a lark. When I, I was writing screenplays, I wrote The Big Mango first just on whim. And I had no idea if it was any good or if it would sell. And back in those days, Asia Book was still in the publishing business. 
And so I just gave it to them because I knew a guy over there and just, you know, whatever you guys want to do, it's okay. If you, if you don't want to do it, don't worry about it. And they published it in some about 100,000 copies in a couple of years. Yeah. Because and, and it was translated to Thai too. Yeah, it's and that's, been that's kind of an interesting. It's been translated as well. to a bunch of languages. Uh, Mango did very, very well. But it, you know, once that, that happened, then I thought, okay, well, I guess I'd take this seriously. And I started uh, paying a little more attention to the, the process of writing. But, you know, the whole idea from the beginning was. If you don't have a publisher, you can't reach people. And, and I wasn't really working hard to reach a lot of people, so I allowed my books to be published here when uh, Asia Book and, and I decided we didn't see things exactly the same way. I went to a Hong Kong publisher and was published there. And I was published by a number of small houses in Asia, but I was only being distributed here. So I got a deal from a UK publisher. And I go, oh, this is great, man. Now, you know, I'll be distributed in the UK yeah. and uh, Europe and all that. Hello, Europe. Here we go. We'll get into the yeah. U.S. and so forth. And about three months later, a Singaporean media group bought the UK publisher. And I was back in Asia again. Fantastic. And, and so after a while, I just decided, you know, there's enough of this because distribution was lousy and you were always wrangling over payments and reports and, and all the rest of it. So I, I had the right under my contract to terminate them on relatively short notice. So I terminated all the licenses, took back all the rights, began marketing uh, my own books directly through a Hong Kong company that I've an association with into the US, in the UK, and now I sell 10 times as many books as I ever sold before. Yeah, and you're selling more, but with e-books and with Kindle. Kindle has a special... Uh, yeah, it does. And, and you know, I, that's, I, that's a very smart... Well, I mean, there's a commercial aspect to it. Yeah. You're right. There's a commercial, but I think there's also another aspect to it, which is worth mentioning, and and that is that the relationship between writers and readers is closer than it has ever been, because the availability of social media and contact through the internet and so forth, your readers feel like they know you, they can reach you. Um, I, I hear from readers constantly. And not too many years ago, that was impossible. That's right. You just couldn't. And, uh. and with that kind of breakdown, I think it has really exposed the publishing business uh, in, in the sense that readers have always cared very much how they spend their time, what they read. Writers, of course, care very much what they write. But the dirty little secret of the book business has always been that in between, most people didn't give a crap. A, a retailer wants his shelves full. He doesn't even know what's on his shelves most of the time, much less believe that it makes any difference what's on his shelves. Publishers, on the whole, don't much care either, that they just need to turn the sausage machine and crank out a certain number of books. Right. And, and the people who really mattered, the readers and the writers, were the ones that publishers and retailers cared least about because they viewed it as a commodity business. They were, they were only interested in selling units, basically. If, if you got tomato soup on the shelf, you're going to sell tomato soup. Yeah. Try going to a supermarket and convince them that your tomato soup is really better. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. They just have to have tomato soup on the shelves. And writers have always liked to sort of believe that their publishers love them and care about them. And that's just garbage. Publishers couldn't care less. We're interchangeable. You quit they'll get somebody to replace you. I quit, they get somebody to replace me. And, and readers, you, know, you gotta respect readers, and publishers don't. They think they can cram anything in the world down a reader's throat. So there's no real person, personality yeah. to it, there's, there's no real attachment to it. Well, there's an old saying in the publishing business that publishers decide in advance what books are going to sell. Because you can't sell a book if it doesn't get exposure. And when you go in Barnes & Noble or a bookstore and you have this nice table up front that's got these books, the impression a lot of people have is booksellers display those books because those are the ones they think you should be interested in. But the truth is they display those books because they're paid to. A publisher pays rent on those spots on the table for books to be displayed. So if your publisher pays for you to be displayed hugely, you will be displayed hugely. And, and books which are pure crap sell enormously because they get enormous exposure. And books which are worthy of being discovered, nobody discovers because there's no exposure. They'll never, they'll never be They're found. stuck in the back like this, yeah. spying out. If somebody wants to buy it, they can go in and find it. But people aren't going to discover it by browsing. And, and there's less and less bookstores now for people to actually yep. go out of their way to, to browse a store and decide 
what, what it is they're going to take home today. And, and it, time, time is precious also. Well, so, I, mean, I think that's what, I, you know, if I point that out, to me that's the really important thing about having respect for your readers. When someone buys your book, whether they pay $20 for it or $5 for it, that's not much money. But what they're giving you as a writer that has enormous value is eight or 10 or 12 hours of their time, however long it takes to read that book. And you gotta respect that time because there are a lot of things that people can do with 10 hours. And I can think nothing, uh, I can think nothing really more flattering than somebody who says, man, I really, I enjoyed that book. I, I love that 10 hours I spent with you and I'd like to spend another 10 hours with you. I'd like to buy another book. That has great value. And, and I don't think publishers on the whole value their readers any more than Campbell's tomato soup dispensers value the people who eat the soup, that they see it as a commodity. And, and I think what Amazon has, has begun to do is to break that down yeah. because readers who buy you through Amazon don't feel like a commodity. Yeah. And, and they feel like that they have a relationship with you and they can reach out and send you a note and tell you, boy, I like that, or I didn't much like that, or when is there going to be another one, or for God's sakes, don't write any more of these. <laughs> and, and that matters to or, people. Or they can't wait for the next installment. Which, Absolutely which, which wonderful is stuff. I just love uh, it. It's wonderful. Jake, tell me about your two Asian crime fiction series. Well, I, the Big Mango, which we talked about before, is, is what writers call a standalone. I, I, I think I mentioned I sort of wrote it on a whim to see if I could figure out how to write a novel. And when it did pretty well, you I seem to have a knack for But I start. I, I thought it'd be fun to set a series out here, and I started on what became the Jack Shepard series, which is up to four books now and soon to be five. Shepard is uh, an American lawyer who, like me, ended up out here on a whim, and and over time, his view of where he is and what he's doing here. He started out teaching at Chula. Uh, in the Sassen School for a while, teaching international business, but his connections in America and his involvement in finance and money laundering and so forth never really quite left him, so a series of things happened and that's how you get a series out of it. But Shepard changes over time, and uh, after the second book in the series, Killing Plato, uh, things happened in which he became slightly notorious locally. And Sasson, of course, wanted no part of that. Yes. And so they very quietly let him go, as they would, I think, in real life. Yeah. And Shepard kind of threw up his hands Things and do moved disappear. to Hong Kong. <laughs> and, and began working from Hong Kong. But Thailand never quite leaves him because he has connections here and he knows people. And, and so people bring problems to him. And he still solves those problems. But I think over, over time, the idea of a financial troubleshooter, an expat trying to find his feet, there are, not, there are not many novels about expats. Americans aren't good at that. We don't, we don't think in terms of expatriation. That Americans, I think, have always been keenly suspicious of other Americans who live in other countries. And that suspicion translates into a sort of sense that even the word expatriate yeah. isn't what you think it is, but it means EX hyphen patriot, as in someone who used to be a patriot, but is no longer. That's right, that's right. And, and yeah. Americans don't really identify with it. So it would be interesting to build a series based on an American who is a bit of an uncomfortable expat. Yeah. And, and the Shepherd series, as I said, has now grown to four books uh, and soon to be five, and that, that's one series. The other one uh, is uh, Inspector Samuel Tay of Singapore. Um, I thought it interesting that there's never really been a crime series set in Singapore. Um, and people make jokes about how boring Singapore is. Yeah, I'm sure that's a very healthy crime scene. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting city. And I thought the idea of using a Singaporean CID detective who wasn't real thrilled about being a Singaporean would be kind of interesting. And, um, and so the Sam Tay series has now grown to four books. And each of these series seems to have its own fans, and most people read both, yeah. but everyone seems to have a preference. You either identify with Shepard or you identify with Sam, and, and I'm, I'm quite happy with both series. Keeping two series yeah. going is a hell of a oh, I can imagine, it's a, a lot of work. Would you, would you find it easier basing yourself somewhere else, looking, writing um, uh, new books, looking in, in at, um, the city is, which is the subject of your book, or would you, or would you prefer to be in the city writing? Uh, 
there was a line in, uh, in a movie I, I wrote for Ali McGraw in which she was sitting on a balcony looking out across Bangkok and somebody made some comment about how beautiful it looked. And Ali's line was, it's like most cities, the further away you get, the better it looks. And I've always sort of felt that way, that, that uh, you get far enough away, cities look a lot better. We, we've lived here, um, I don't know, for uh, 25, six, seven years, something like that. But we've always maintained a home in the States as well. So for us, it's never been a question of are we here or did we leave? We're always sort of half here and half there. Yeah, yeah. But over the years, we're more there than here, and we still have our, our place here. We moved to a, a smaller place recently just because our, our son had graduated from college and never comes back, and so we needed less space. But we maintain our place here, and, and we'll probably continue to. But it's, it's not a city which I enjoy being in as much as I used to, to be perfectly honest. And as a result, we spend more time in the States now and less here. Jake, now that you're spending more time in the States, are you going to continue with your Asia series? Have you got something new planned? You know, Keith, I, I think about that a lot. That's a, that's a good question to ask because I think about it a lot. But I think the truth is that both as a reader and a writer, you only have a limited number of books in your life. You only have so much time. I mean, how many books can you read in a year and how many books can you write? And Sometimes I feel like I've sort of gotten on two treadmills here with these two series. But people are good enough to love them and they write me about these characters and they feel these characters are part of their life. And I kind of feel responsible to keep doing it. And so every time I think about writing a book about two kids in North Carolina who buy an elephant, I just decide that's not the thing to do, that I've got, uh, I've got two good series going and I'll, I'll probably continue to write them uh, as long as I'm writing. Jake, thank you for being on the show. Great pleasure, man. It's been I my pleasure. It. And uh, thank you all for watching. And I uh, will see you all again soon. Jake Needham, ladies and gentlemen.